morning and welcome to Bridge Online. My name is Emily and I'm so excited that you're here. Today we have a great word from Pastor Rod in our Unbreakable series, as well as some updates and announcements that you're not going to want to miss. But right now, let's join together in singing with our worship team. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear our anthem arise. Is Jesus your Let 
Hey everyone, so glad you're here with us today. If you're joining us for the first time and would like to know more about The Bridge, we would love to connect with you further. To start, you can email us at hello at thebridgemarkham.com 
or you can also visit thebridgemarkham.com slash new and fill out our connection form. And if you fill out the form, we will have an email gift card just for you. Now, this coming week is the last week to sign up for the August baptism. So make sure you head to bridgeconnect.ca to register. You can also register for our September baptisms as well. So if you're interested in any way to get baptized or you just want to learn more about what baptism is, then head to thebridgeconnect.ca and click on the baptism card. This is the best place for you to check out more information and to register. And once you do, I will personally be in touch with you to talk to you about some next steps. Now, whether you've given throughout the week already or whether you have direct withdrawal already set up for your offering, this morning, we wanna give you the opportunity to give prayerfully and purposefully. You can go to the link on your screen to give. You can e-transfer to giving at thebridgemarkham.com or you can mail a check to the church address. I'd like to thank you for your faithful and generous giving. Finally, you may be feeling that you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel related to the pandemic we've been facing. But how about your personal life in general? What you may have experienced in your personal life may have added more challenges on top of the situation related to the pandemic. Maybe it's the death of a loved one, separation or divorce, financial insecurity, sickness, loss of a job or a miscarriage. I'm with you. It certainly can be overwhelming. If you are in a season like this, just remember to take one step at a time or one day at a time. You can do this and you can make it through. But let me tell you, it is hard to do it on your own. No matter how many books you read and seek out self-help resources, there is a special healing and strengthening of your soul that takes place when you are journeying together and processing your pain with a community of people who have gone through a similar experience like yourself. This is what seasonal groups at the bridge are all about. Seasonal groups are short-term support groups that journey together to provide you with the resources and comfort needed for you to overcome the challenges you may be experiencing and help you along in your journey so that you can experience hope and healing in the midst of it. We are offering four different seasonal groups online this fall. They are grief care, divorce care, hope and beyond, and the marriage course. Why not take that first step and join one of the seasonal support groups that meets your need and begin your journey towards experiencing the fullness of life as it was meant to be. For more information about each of these groups and to register, please visit our website seasonalgroups.com or email us at seasonalgroups at thebridgemarkham.com Please know, even if it hurts and even if it's hard, it's okay to not be okay. But don't settle for a lifetime of not okay. Take the first step and register for a seasonal group. Let's journey together. We hope to see you soon. Good morning. I hope your summer is going well, and I pray that you, your families, and friends are feeling refreshed and blessed during the season. I am Jay Anand Rajan, and I'm here on behalf of the Board Nomination Committee to draw your attention to the Board Member Nomination process. Our next annual business meeting is tentatively scheduled for Sunday, November 21st. Further details will be provided to you at a later date. We would like to start the process to find suitable board members to take on this ministry role for the next three years. The Board Nomination Committee requests your prayerful engagement 
in the matters of our church and to nominate members to the board. Current board members Kevin Aid is completing a six-year term, thus will not be eligible for re-election. Bill Buck is completing his first three-year term and is eligible for re-election. Thus, there are two positions that need to be filled. We would like to thank Kevin Aid and Bill Buck for serving in the board so diligently. The nomination committee for the board is comprised of Pastor Brian Childs, Sonia Tan, Winston Stewart, Joanne Williams, Jason Lamb, and myself. The timeline for the nomination process is as follows. Today, August 15th, the board nomination opens via our Bridge website. September 5th, our board nomination closes. Between September 5th and October 3rd, the nomination committee will review and contact those who are eligible to consider becoming a board member. October 4th, a final list of qualified names would be prepared to present to you the membership. Between October 10th and November 21st, we will present the qualified names to the membership. And on Sunday, November 21st, the annual business meeting will take place and you will have an opportunity to elect and affirm the new members of the board. The role of the board member is to partner with the lead pastor in the overall direction, governance and administration of the bridge so as to guide the pastors and congregation towards God honoring best practices and purposeful ends. Please visit the board nomination webpage for more information. Now to the qualifications for board members for you to nominate. A member of the church in good standing for at least two years. A nominee should be consistently participating in a life group, serving opportunity and attend a weekend service. They must support the operation of the church and its ministries through tithing. And the leadership qualities of the bridge that we are looking for is calling, character, competency, chemistry, a capacity to serve, and convictions. How you can nominate. During the next three weeks, you may submit your nominations online via our church website. The link is provided here for your reference and you can find it on our website as well. Based on the qualifications and your prayerful consideration, please consider nominating members to the board. We would like to thank you all for your engagement and commitment to serving God. Thank you and have a blessed week. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Rod, and I'm the youth pastor here at The Bridge, and I'm so excited to be joining you all this morning. You know, we're coming toward the end of our series called Unbreakable, where we've been exploring what it means to stay the course and not get lost in the midst of all of life's uncertainties. And in doing so, we've been looking at Jesus as our great example of what it could look like for us to maintain our core principles and purposes, despite the many things in life trying to throw us off course. But before we jump into everything, I want to hop into our scripture reading. And as well, I want to pray about the things that have been taking place in the world. I want to pray about the earthquake that happened in Haiti. And I want to pray about the disorder that's been going on in Afghanistan. But first, let's read God's word um, because we're going to pray and speak God's word into the things that are going on in the world. So let's read. We're in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 13. Let's read. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. 
And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Let's pray. God, we just thank you, man. We thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for all that you are doing, not only in our lives, but we know, God, that you are working uh, in the world. God, we know that you sent your son, Jesus, uh, to give his life for us, not only to free us from sin, but just to show that he is the one who is ruling and reigning over all things. And so, God, you see the hurt and the pain that is happening in Haiti due to another earthquake. God, you see the hurt and the pain and the disorder that is taking place in Afghanistan. God, you see it all. And so, God, we're just coming before you and we're just asking that you do what you always do, that you would act and move and be very present in those places. But God, even more, that, that God, you would send those who are followers of Jesus to be the hands and the feet in those places that are hurting right now, God. God, we, we are trusting to you, trusting you. We are crying out to you. We know, God, that you are a God who hears us and answers our prayers. And so, God, we thank you. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for moving. And, and God, even in just this moment, we thank you for, for softening our hearts to the word that is about to be spoken to everyone who is listening. That, God, that, that we are softened hearts towards your word and the things that you have given me to say. And so, God, we just give you all the glory all the praise. And we pray these things in your son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so listen. Now I know it might not look like it right now, but I actually do really enjoy working out and going to the gym. I enjoy the feeling after a good workout and the challenge of testing my physical limits of my body. I can actually recall many times when I would put weight on the bar that I knew I couldn't lift, but because I had my spotter there, I would give it a try anyways and attempt to get stronger. I would often keep a record of all my workouts so I could plan my future workouts better. So I knew how much to lift and when to lift it. And it was just always a great feeling to be able to lift an amount of weight that I was never able to lift before. There's simply just this kind of excitement that is surrounded around being able to challenge your physical limits and then being able to overcome those limits. Now, the, the gym is an easy place to figure out the limits of what you can do and what you cannot do. If the weight is too heavy, you're not lifting it, and then you know your limit. But what about in life? How do we go about figuring out the limits of what we can handle in life before actually exceeding those limits? And I don't know about you, but for me, when it comes to establishing a healthy rhythm for my life, I am a complete work in progress. And this actually became most evident to me during my last school year when I got the bright idea of thinking I could take two courses each semester for my master's while still pastoring full time just because everything was online. I found all these good reasons to justify this unwise decision. I told myself I would graduate earlier and since everything was online, I'd have more time. You know, it's just funny how we can always come up with good reasons to do foolish things. And sure, uh, in the end, I completed everything, which means I accomplished what I set out to do for the year. And honestly, I think that's great. But, you know, I also ended up being really stressed the majority of that year and overwhelmed. I found myself constantly busy going from one thing to the next. Instead of doing a few things great, I end up doing a bunch of things poorly. I had no rhythm to my life. I had no harmony. And unfortunately, many of you, too many of you listening to this right now can both relate and identify with what I'm saying. Whether that has to do with seeking success in your career, seeking a certain GPA at school, or whatever your personal success goal may be. Or maybe you just have a fear of missing out and or lack the courage to say that magical two-letter word, no. 
whatever it may be for you. Many of us are living lifestyles that are so jam-packed with the things we hope to achieve or the things others have asked us to do, and it's causing us to live lives that are stressed, overwhelmed, unhealthy, and ultimately leading us to a life that is burned out. Now, some of you are hearing this and you're thinking, yeah, you know what, that's a good point. It's time that I take stock of my life and make some changes. But then there are others of you who, like me, are convinced that you have your overwhelming situation under control. And the truth of the matter is, when it comes to knowing your limits, you can either humble yourself or be humbled by your overwhelming situation. Either way, we all will arrive at or hit the wall of realizing our limits. You know, I was reading an article the other day that was talking about the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. And in the modern version of the oath, new doctors are reminded of the importance of humility and are encouraged to not be ashamed to say, I don't know, as well as reach out to their colleagues on topics they are unfamiliar with. The article goes on to say, being able to confidently say you don't know the answer to something actually builds trust and transparency, especially if you follow that up with, but I will do everything I can to find out. Because in reality, as the author continues, any doctor, doctor who can't admit the limits of their knowledge, energy, and skill are simply lying to themselves. The author of the article then makes this point by saying, there is a risk to not knowing your limits. And in this age of information and misinformation, being humble and knowing your limits is more important than ever. Now, personally, I'm all for testing our limits for the purpose of promoting growth in our lives, whether that's physically, mentally, or otherwise. I do believe sometimes that is needed. However, I also believe that there is a way with which it is to be done in a healthy manner. Because when we place ourselves in the position of experiencing stress or exerting our limits for long periods of time without any effort to alter or change our situation, it is in those times that we begin to feel hopeless, lack motivation, or lose our sense of caring. Actually, the psychologist who coined the term burnout actually describes it as a depletion of exhaustion of a person's physical or mental resources attributed to his or her prolonged yet unsuccessful striving towards unrealistic expectations internally or externally derived. Meaning, burnout isn't simply about not having enough energy, motivation, or passion. Rather, the core thought behind burnout usually is, will this ever get better? And so, as we begin to look now at the life of Jesus, what I would like to submit to you all this morning is, when we live lives with a sole purpose of constantly staying connected to Jesus, it is there where we begin to live a life that is not headed towards burnout, but is actually headed towards restoration and wholeness and well-being. So, in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul is actually writing a letter to the Philippian believers because he's concerned that the believers are hindering their witness of the gospel to the city of Philippi due to their eternal strife and their selfish ambition that was taking place in the church community. And so to address this problem, Paul encourages the Philippian church towards humility, and he uses Jesus Christ as the model for which they should imitate. Paul writes this, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to forcefully cling on to. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. Biblical scholar and theologian Gordon Fee actually says that these verses are among the strongest expressions of Christ's deity in the New Testament. Because here, Paul is making the bold claim saying, before Jesus was a man, he was actually the very nature of God. That Jesus was eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, limitless in all his ways, yet he willfully and humbly decided to take on the form and limits of a human. And Paul doesn't stop there. He also reminds the Philippian believers, Paul is actually reminding us that Jesus went even further than that. Because even as a man, Jesus lived a humble life in obedience to the Father. You know, sometimes I think of all the other things Jesus could have done while on earth. Or how much more Jesus could have done while he was on earth. I think of the places that Jesus did go to and the places that he did not go to. 
I think of the people that Jesus did heal and the people that he didn't heal. I think of the things that Jesus taught and the things that he chose not to teach. While on earth, Jesus chose to travel through life thoughtfully and with purpose, ultimately seeking to live a life in humble obedience to his Father in heaven. And I think there are many places where we can go to see this in the Gospels, but one particular story that stuck out to me while I was studying was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That just before heading to suffer and die on the cross for humanity's sins, we actually find Jesus in the garden crying out to his father in prayer, asking if there is any other way for this to go down. That if it is possible, please let this cup of suffering pass from me. But then, then Jesus ends by saying, yet not as I will, but as you will, Father. I think the Apostle Paul was hoping his letter to the Philippians would, would move their hearts in the same way that I hope our hearts are also being moved as we are reminded of how Jesus could have used his divinity to do anything he wanted. But instead, Jesus uses his divinity as an opportunity to lay his life down for you and me so that in exchange, we could receive salvation and restoration. Paul then continues in the book of Philippians in chapter 2 and verses 12 and 13 and basically says, in light of all of this, now Philippian believers, do this. And this is what he says. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. You know, I think the question these verses should cause us to ask is, how should followers of Jesus be living out their faith? How should they be working out their salvation? Again, Gordon Fee in his commentary on Philippians, he says this, one does not live out the gospel casually or lightly, but as one who knows what it means to stand in awe of the living God. The gospel is God's thing, and the God who has saved his people is an awesome God. Thus, working out the salvation that God has given them should be done with a sense of holy awe and wonder before the God with whom they and we worship. I believe followers of Jesus should be living purposeful and well thought out lives. We should not just be letting life happen to us or allowing our schedules to get out of control for so long that we are simply living stressed and overwhelmed and burnt out lives. Instead, as believers, we are constantly working out our faith with fear and trembling, leaving space for God to both interrupt and speak into our lives. God wants to do a work in our lives so that we can both be used by him in the lives of our family, friends, and coworkers. God wants to do a work in our lives so that he can take all of the hurt and pain and weariness and all of the messed up stuff that our stressed and jam-packed schedules have produced in our lives and in the lives of our family and friends. And he wants to take all of that brokenness and, and not simply try to figure out somehow to piece it all back together somehow. Rather, instead, Jesus wants to make you completely brand new. He wants to start this process of restoration in your life where you will end up being completely whole, resting in him alone. And so, as followers of Jesus, we need to be people who are paying attention to their lifestyles and to their schedules. Ultimately, trying to establish a rhythm and pace of life that is daily seeking to stay connected to the limitless source named Jesus. So uh, recently, I actually, I started running. And, and prior to a month ago or so, I actually, in fact, hated running long distances. At that time, I didn't enjoy the effort that was required to do it. But actually now, one of my favorite things about running long distances is that mental challenge. That at a certain point during my run, every single time, everything in me just wants to stop. But it is the mental challenge of overcoming that feeling and continuing to push through. And it was actually my cousin, when I went back home, he, he was the one that got me into running. And even though before, neither of us were really kind of in the running, we were actually always around sports still, all of our lives. So the one thing that we knew was important about running long distances or running sprints is that pacing yourself is really important. But here's the thing, 
neither me or my cousin are in our primes anymore. Our dreams of being the greatest athletes to ever live are far behind us. But the problem is, just because you're not in your prime anymore doesn't mean you lose that competitive spirit. And well, that's my cousin. And so recently when we were running sprints together, I remember saying over and over again, hey, let's pace ourselves. Let's just pace ourselves. But you know, we didn't want to listen. So we line up, we head into our sprint, and as we're going and going, all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I see him pull up and slowly limp to a stop. He ended up pulling his hamstring. And you know what, he's okay now because he's the type of guy who can get hurt or stop working out and he'll still be fine with picking up where he left off in just a couple months. But I think the moral of the story here is, again, you can either humble yourself or be humbled by your situation. And you see in life, it's all about the creep. Unlike pulling a hamstring, realizing that you are living beyond your limits usually doesn't happen in one noticeable swoop. Rather, it happens little by little inch by inch, a yes here and a yes there, a oh, I can do that for you, or a, I don't mind doing that. In life, it is the creep that gets us off pace, throws us off rhythm, and ultimately disconnects us from Jesus. And so, how do we get that under control? How can we get a rhythm to life that is daily seeking to maintain our connection to this limitless source named Jesus? so that we can begin to live lives that are being restored to wholeness and well-being. Recently, I was actually reminded of an ancient Christian tradition called a rule of life. A friend of mine sent me a podcast that I'm actually going to recommend to you all right now called the Fight, Hustle, and Hurry podcast. It's hosted by Jeff Skimbethke and John Mark Comer. It is an amazing podcast that is teaching all about this very topic that we've been talking about today. But if you're not a podcast person, even though you should probably be a podcast person, I can also recommend to you their books. Jefferson Bethke, he, he wrote a book on this topic called To Hell with the Hustle. And John Mark Comer's book is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Now, this ancient Christian concept of a rule of life is all about abiding in Jesus, staying connected to Jesus and keeping God at the center of everything we do. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 15, we can actually see, in fact, this is what Jesus is calling us to do when he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. And so, having a rule of life actually isn't about creating a bunch of rules for your life. It's not that. So, so don't let the title of the concept confuse you. Rather, it's about creating a structure, a schedule, a rhythm and pace of life that imitates Jesus and makes our connection to him our central focus. Therefore, the key question to be asking ourselves is, who am I becoming by the things I'm doing? Am I living intentionally or unintentionally? Am I living thoughtfully or simply allowing life to happen to me? Am I creating space for God and my family and friends or am I scrolling aimlessly on social media? Now, the rule of life has evolved over the years. In modern day, you can look to authors like the ones I've already mentioned, or authors like Pete Siscaro or John Ertberg, and, and get different variations of the rule of life. And you can even go as far back uh, to our early church fathers in the 4th and 5th and 6th century and begin to read there as well about how they talked about the rule of life. But again, Although there may be many variations, at the heart of all of this is the question of how can we live lives that are daily connected to Jesus so that we may imitate him? You know, in the Fight, Hustle, and, and Hurry podcast, they submit to us seven habits that we can practice. Those seven are silence, Sabbath, slowing down, simplicity, obscurity, empathy, and saying no. And instead of trying to, you know, say a little bit about each of those, 
uh, I'm actually going to just encourage you again to go and listen to the podcast because it's so good. And instead, I'll also just speak about the three that have impacted me the most so far. So the first one, silence. When is the last time you had real honest silence? where you weren't taking in any kind of information from your phone or laptop or TV, you weren't listening to music or you weren't even reading a book, just silence. Now I know, for parents, this probably seems impossible and you're actually gonna have to get creative with this to make it happen. And I mean, in the gospels, Jesus would just randomly leave the disciples and disappear into the mountains. And I don't know if that's a, a good parenting style, but hey, you would be into imitating Jesus. Now, nonetheless, the purpose of adding silence to our rhythm of life is we are, we are trying to provide space for God to speak to us, to direct us, to do a work in our hearts. But also, we are trying to provide space for ourselves to deal with the deep things that are going on inside of us. No longer pushing those things aside or, or stuffing those things down, but instead confronting those things and then giving them to Jesus. And, and if I'm honest, if this is your first time trying this out, you're going to want to start small here. Please, please don't discourage yourself by trying to have an hour of silence right out the gate. That's a bad idea. Now, usually my time of silence normally happens in the morning. I used to wake up and the first thing I would do was try to grab my phone, like probably most of you. And, you know, you want to see what happened while I was asleep. What happened last night? What did I miss out on? And, and I would also actually turn on worship music. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I wanted to try out this silence thing. And so in, in trying it out, I'm kind of just sitting there with my coffee, doing my best to just bask in the silence. And then all these different types of things start bubbling up inside of me and in my mind. And, and then all of a sudden I look at my watch and I go, oh my gosh, it's only been five minutes. It was definitely tough there for the first couple of times of me trying it, but I kept doing it. I kept leaning into it and I can say the Lord has been working in me slowly but surely in ways that I did not expect. And so for you, it could be just that 10 or 15 minutes in the morning or it could be providing yourself an extra 10 or 15 minutes in the car before you head to work or finding those moments while you're driving in the car to have no radio or nothing playing, just silence. Or maybe it's going to the coffee shop by yourself and, and making sure you're not taking out your phone or anything, just sitting there and enjoying the moment, allowing God to speak to you. However this may look for you, get creative, add this to your schedule and slowly but surely add more and more moments of silence in your life. The impact of the next two spiritual habits kind of go hand in hand for me. That is slowing down and saying no. And I'm not saying I'm particularly good at these, Actually, I'd say I'm more and more realizing how bad I am at them and how I need to be more intentional with taking stock of my life and figuring out what is most important to me. Because saying no isn't about simply saying no. It's about making sure you have margin in life. It's about making sure you have space to say yes to the right things. You cannot say yes to the right things if you're always spending right up to what you have or even worse, overspending what you have whether we're talking about money, your time, or your energy. Think about it like this. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be generous. But how can we be generous if our finances aren't in order or if we are not purposeful with our finances? Or another, how often do our schedules not allow for us to be able to respond properly in the moment, to be able to be loving and present during the interruptions that may come during our day or our week. In the Gospels, you can just see that Jesus is so good at this because he, he lived a slow life. He was not in a hurry to move from town to town. And it was like he welcomed interruptions into his life, always being present with the people who would come to him with a urgent need. And Jesus was able to do this because he made sure he had margin in life. He had space to hear from God so that he could live according to his father's will. Okay, honest moment here. Anyone who knows me knows I suck at texting back. You could text me today and I would respond to you next week as if a week had not even gone by. Now, some of this is actually intentional and some of this is, well, I just need to get better at texting back. But the truth is, 
We do not have any more time during the day than someone would have a hundred years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago. But what we do have is way more access to our lives. People are able to call you and text you and ask you and email you and DM you. In addition to the internet allowing us to have more friends and relationships than any one of us can actually manage. And so it's like, what do we do? We can't add more time to the day. And so we are just left with making sure that we are so much better at saying no, becoming so much better at slowing down. On the podcast, John Mark Comer talks about our desires being infinite, that the heart's desire will always long for more, yet everything other than Jesus is finite. So what happens when your infinite desire runs up against finite things and possessions? Well, you end up in a habitual state of stress, being overwhelmed and discontent, caught up in the life of hustle and hurry with no margin in life, constantly overspending what you have. But God, God sent his son so that he could be our infinite satisfaction. And it's when we place Jesus at the center of our lives, seeking a lifestyle that is constantly connected to him, that we will be able to live lives that are producing fruit because we will have been made new and made whole by the limitless source named Jesus. My prayer this morning is that we will become people who are abiding in Jesus, allowing him to do a work in us, producing the fruits of spirit in our lives so that we will be people who hear from God because we practice silence. That we will be people who find rest in Jesus because we practice Sabbath. That we will be patient with others because we have slowed down in our lives. That we will know what matters most to us because we practice simplicity in our lives. That we will be living faithful and humble lives because we lean into a life of obscurity. That we will be people known for our love and kindness because of our empathy, that we will know to say no, that we will know when to say no so that we can become a source of life for the things that we say yes to, a source of life for our family, friends, and coworkers. May this be true of all of us as we await in hopeful anticipation of Jesus Christ's return when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of our God, our Father. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus.
Today. It was so good to be with you. For any more information or to find out what's happening at the bridge, you can head to bridgeconnect.ca. Well, we'll see you next week. Have a great week.